Hello, and welcome to How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting a company in 2020. This is a collection of conversations with people who have all successfully started, run, and even sold their own companies, sharing not only professional but personal experiences on what we should be doing now, next, or never. In this episode, we hear from Nick Bridal, who, having retired from the military, founded Bellstone Dart, a risk management consultancy in 2017. Nick explains the importance of getting a client to pay for your product or service as soon as possible, as you need to qualify the concept commercially, because until this happens, it doesn't really matter how pretty your logo might be. He also talks about how being new to the playing field can mean you're a target for bullying tactics from the more established players, but this is okay, as it means you're a genuine threat. Hello, morning, how are you? Yeah, great, thanks, all good. Where are you in the world right now? Dubai. Incredible. I would love it if you could start off just introducing who you are, what your company is, when you set it up, and a little bit about it if possible. So I'm Nick. I set up a company about three and a half years ago now called Bellstone Dart International. Uh, We're a consultancy. We specialise in helping people work in, in East Africa. And when you say consultancy, any particular industry? No, not really. I mean, it's mainly about what type of industries slash organisations want to work in those parts of the world. So it's a lot of charities, people like the UN, and private companies who are doing work in support of international organisations and I guess some private companies. Just helping them get set up on the ground. Yeah, essentially. And we, we use a consultancy as sort of a, a route to market almost. So by talking to people and having you know open discussions about what they're trying to achieve, we also get to have an understanding of what they might actually tangibly need once they start doing what they say they're going to do. So we then position ourselves to also provide that. So we sort of pitch ourselves as a consultancy, but then we also provide sort of follow on services as necessary. Amazing. And what was it that gave you the idea to start this company? Well, I was leaving the military after spending well, my entire sort of adult working life in the military and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. My initial plan had been to sort of just sit around for six months and wait until my brain said, Nick, you want to do this or, or you love X, so go and work out a way that you can do this. But as often happens, I just, just happened to meet a guy uh, when I was working in East Africa whilst I was still in the military. And we got talking about you know, the opportunities that are there. And we kicked it around for a bit and then said, right, well, let's, let's give it a go and see, see how we go. Incredible. And what does it mean to you to run your own company now, having been in the military? It's a massive step change from being in a very sort of structured environment to one where, you know, there is zero structure apart from what you make or, or build yourself. I don't know yet what it means because it's been such a fast journey that there's still a huge mixture of conflicting feelings about what it's like and, and the good points and the bad points and things. I think generally it's that freedom to make as much or as little of something as, as you like and, and all of it's on you. It doesn't depend on getting the right support from the corporate or whoever it is. It's down to what you want to make of it. And that's very, very challenging, but also at the same time is a privileged position to be in. That's so interesting. So many people have said that, that they've gone, and I felt the same when you've gone from payroll and you expected to be somewhere at a certain time and do a certain job to this complete freedom, which has its blessings and its curses, because that also comes with, I imagine, quite a lot of pressure. And for you coming from the military, never have you come from somewhere that's more rule based. Is that fair? And now you're working out for yourself. I mean, you must have learned so much. Is there anything that you particularly have transferred out into this new role that you've created? I think there's a lot. And when I was in the last couple of years of being in the military, I started doing an MBA. I haven't actually finished it yet. I need to I need to do that, but it's a question of time. I think that what we don't realise that we have in the military is that we are really good at talking to people, building sort of teams, and then making teams do things well. And it was interesting to me when I did the first stage of the MBA, pretty much the first year of it was about leadership and, and whatnot. And for lots of the other people that were on the course who had come from who were civilians, it was all sort of new to them. And I was sat there going, oh, wow, well, I know all this. So I think that element of it, thinking about stakeholders and people and, and how you get them to become a part of your team or trust in what you're doing is, is something that's definitely transferred. But I think probably the single most useful thing is saying what you're going to do and then doing it. 
you know, it's like reliability and responsiveness that is sort of ingrained in us that actually is paid dividends for, for the new business. So if someone asks us for a quote or to do something, we get back to them straight away. Whereas our sort of competitors, who are all big boys, don't. They have to get it approved by management and then that manager is on holiday. And before you know it, they've not through any fault of what they're offering taking themselves out of the running just because they're too slow and sort of making it easy for people to give you their business is you know, one of the top five things I think that new startups should be trying to do. When you were facing your looming deadline of leaving the army, and I know for years you'd had this deadline in your mind and we had lots of chats about it and you're exploring lots of different opportunities. When you had this sort of meeting and this idea, what was it you then did first? Spoke to people and took some advice. My uncle was a huge help. And my parents had also set up and run their own business. So just garnered some opinion on, on what you should do. And you know, one of the things was make a business plan. So we did that. And it wasn't a very, I, I look at it now sometimes and laugh, but just physically sort of writing down what you think you're going to do and how you think you're going to do it. And then what money you might need and all those kind of things just help get you in the, in the right mindset. And then pretty soon after that, just actually getting on and setting up the company. So getting it registered a company's house and then going through the processes of setting up bank accounts and all those kind of things. And it is one of those, well, for me anyway, it was one of those activities that you just need to start doing. And then once you start doing it, you learn what what else follows and what else you need to do. Because you were really kind to me because I found out within 24 hours that I was setting up my own company due to redundancy. And, and you gave me some great advice when I first started out. And you were one of my biggest cheerleaders in that sense. I'm not sure if I should call an ex-army officer a cheerleader, but anyway. But you gave me some really practical advice of register the company, set up a bank account, get a good accountant. And is there any advice you could offer in terms of how to go about writing a business plan? There are lots of bits and bobs of advice that you can give on stuff like, you know, your financial projections and how much things are going to cost. And generally, your financial projections are going to be inflated and your idea of how much things are going to cost are going to be you know, deflated. We found that when we looked back at our business plan, we we're like, wow, we said we're going to be earning X in a year's time. And that's just ridiculous. So whatever you think it is, probably, you know, half and double respectively, depending on which, which element you're looking at. Ditto with timings, you know, everything will take longer. And if even you think about a project lifetime, you might get wind of something coming along and then you might get a month or so to write a bid for it and then they might take a month or so to tell you about it and then you might get a month or so to get it ready and then you might deliver it for a month and then you might get paid after another month or two so from actually starting to work on it to actually getting the money in you're in six months already which obviously has a massive impact and then you also said to me something quite interesting about getting a client and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that yeah I think that there are lots of brilliant ideas for businesses People are often sort of setting up companies and all that kind of thing. But the difference between a successful startup and not is actually knowing that you can get a client. Uh, there's a big difference between having a great idea or a really pretty sign or a great logo and actually getting money in through the door, which is the only thing that counts at the end of the day. And so knowing that you can get that first client is huge. And we, we, we were pretty confident that we, we knew we could get at least one. And then once you've got one, you can, you can build it from there. And it was interesting because you said it doesn't even matter what they pay you. Just to know that there is someone paying you something gives you that validation. It's happening. You are live. You're going. What is it you enjoy the most now about being self-employed, having come out of the military? Good question. <laughs> it sort of varies week to week. I mean, some weeks it's, it's incredibly hard. You know, you're working as much as, as is possible whilst trying to obviously juggle life and everything else in between. But I think flexibility it gives you in terms of you know if I want to spend the day with Alice my wife or whatever then then I can I just know that I need to get up early or stay up later and do whatever it is that's on my to-do list and I think that flexibility is really great. Well I loved it the fact that you've been in London more and obviously you can see Alice far more regularly than you had been when you were in the army and by the way congratulations on getting married <laughs> Alice. <laughs> Thank you. And what is it you potentially enjoy the least about this new way of working for you? I think there are sort of two sides to it. One is that lots of what is required to run a business, I don't actually enjoy doing in of itself. I don't like accounts. I don't like books. I don't like all that kind of stuff. But I have to do it. And so that sometimes feels like a bit of a burden. So that's sort of in terms of day-to-day -day what I don't necessarily enjoy. The only other thing that sometimes you're sort of aware of is that as a startup, you are the new kid on the block. And a lot of people don't like it when startups or, or new companies in a market are successful. And so the sort of the knives come out. And also, 
you, you get bullied quite a lot. Really? Yeah. I mean, again, I guess it, it changes by industry. But for us, you know, we never say no to anything. We'll always take on a, a client or a task, even if it's really small, because you never know where it might lead. And we've had a couple of examples where, you know, seemingly small things are almost more of a bother to do than they are worth it, you know, financially or time-wise or whatever, have led to, to much bigger things. And we've been really glad that we did. But oftentimes we found that when you are dealing with big companies, um, not through any sort of malicious intent or anything, but just because they've got processes and they're very rich and so they can't change them, things that they don't even think about are huge issues for you. And, you know, an example of that might be payment terms. You know, a big company might have a generic rule that they only pay in 60 days. And for a small business, you know, when you're, especially when you're starting, your cash flow is worse. That's huge. And so an inability to sort of challenge on those kind of things is a challenge that I don't really enjoy sometimes. And actually on payment terms, how have you worked out how your pricing works and what you can ask of a client? I'd love to hear about how you sort of gone in and did up to your own pricing structure. I mean, clearly, whatever industry you're going into, you, you'll have an idea, or at least you should, you should uh, have an idea of what things cost, what the market looks like, and price points and stuff. But it, we actually didn't focus on that. We, we had a general awareness of what those were, and you know, we needed to be sure that we could compete with those effectively. But the way we approached it was, well, how much is this going to cost us? And then what do you think is fair to to put on as a margin and that approach has stood us in really good stead because because we're able to do things relatively efficiently anyway we have found without necessarily even trying to we've beaten everyone on price all the time that combined with responsiveness and and simply doing what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it has actually sort of helped us outperform most of our competitors if not all especially when it comes to sort of bid processes and clients so we, we haven't lost one yet so I think just doing it on a non-greedy, fair, what do we think is reasonable approach is much better than necessarily pricing yourself what, where you think you might be able to get away with or pricing yourself really, really high just because you think, well, if I price myself high, then people are going to think I'm excellent. And have you ever had to sort of stand up to a client about your pricing, whether they've tried to haggle you down or if they've just seen it and thought, great, that's a winner? Uh, most most people always ask if you, know, if you can do anything with it. But we are reasonably open, probably too open sometimes about sort of saying, well, look, you know, realistically, here are some examples of our costs and therefore there's, you know, there's not really much we can do. Mm, so the clarity. Yeah, exactly. And just so that they can sort of reassure their their sort of powers that be that, no, actually, you know, we're getting a good rate here. And obviously it always helps if you're sort of normally cheaper than the, the competition anyway. I think that's it with a service. It's quite tricky because there is a basic cost of goods for the service, but people don't really understand that. And I've found that conversation quite hard because it's the first time I've been having those conversations with clients to say, well, actually, for me to actually do the job, it will take this amount of time and therefore this costs X. And I think that clarity conversation, that detail has reassured them. It's a hard one with services because you could be better than somebody else, but until they work with you, they don't know that yet. You're absolutely right. And I, I think that what helps in those conversations is if you have done your pricing the way that I just described, straight away you're on much firmer ground because you haven't sort of taken a punt and gone, right, well, I'm going to stick 100% margin on this. And then when they challenge you on it, if they're decent people, they'll, they'll almost be able to sense it, that you, that you were sort of taking the mickey a bit. Whereas if you know you've sat down and gone, okay, what, what's this really going to cost me? What's reasonable? Then you can almost just say that. To them. And because you're because it's what you're saying is true and, and you've been fair in the way that you've come to that point, it, it sounds right because it is right. And it's the same for every element of business. You know, do what you say you're going to do, do it fairly, be fair to your employees and all that kind of thing. And even though it might cost the business a little bit more or mean you make a little bit less money, actually it means that your feet are on firm ground when things do go wrong or, you're, or you get challenged on something. It's, it's a good way to do it. And I guess that all comes with experience. And someone said to me, it's like, they're not buying that day rate. They're buying that 20 years worth of experience that you're bringing to that day you're spending with them. And that for me was a real, yes, I do have this tried and tested experience that I can offer them. And therefore I cost X, but it definitely, definitely takes practice. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I said that, you know, we sometimes felt bullied is because in the early days, you know, we didn't know how to have these conversations because we were learning. And so, you know, we probably didn't start them off right or whatever. And it put us in a, in a weaker position, which, you know, at the end of it made us feel like we had been a bit sort of like beaten up, but it passes. 
Yeah. And experience. I mean, someone said to me today, as long as you're happy with the fact that you're always going to be making mistakes, you'll be fine. And I was thinking about it even yesterday saying, it's not necessarily that that email I sent was a mistake, but I know next time how it can be better. And it was that constant learning. And four or five months in now, each time I'm doing something, I'm just doing it that bit better, which makes me feel like on the right track. So coming out of the military and meeting this person that you had this idea with, do you have advice for people about how to choose a business partner or how to manage that relationship with a business partner? Because obviously they are the nearest, dearest person within that business with you. Uh, I mean, I was exceptionally lucky with Darren. We, I mean, we just hit it off and I don't think we would have sort of got as far as we have if if that wasn't the case because it's been incredibly stressful and you know, we, we're on the phone every day at least once. Because you're both working remotely all the time, irrespective of the pandemic, you are always around the world at some point. Yeah, especially in the early, early days. You know, we've had incredibly sort of <laughs> passionate arguments about stuff and that means that relationship's got to be incredibly strong and incredibly resilient. So I think you've got to be really careful. I guess I'm not in a great position to sort of comment because I've been really lucky, but my sense is that if you don't have to take on a business partner, don't, because you never know. And I've seen lots of examples in the last three years of, and heard lots of stories about things going really badly wrong, especially if the business is 50-50 as well uh, between you and your business partner, because if it really comes down to it, you're in serious trouble because there's no... A stalemate. Exactly. So... If you don't have to, don't. But if you do and you want to and it makes sense, then you've got to know them inside out. Otherwise, it's just a, a friction in the business you don't need. And is it a lot of gut feeling? You build that relationship, you learn to trust them? 100% gut feeling. If you could go back and do it all over again, is there anything you wouldn't have done looking back now? No, it's a, it's a short answer. I think there are some things we would have done differently, obviously, but there's nothing that we did that we wouldn't do again i don't think because every time you're learning yeah every time we're learning i think we've also been you know incredibly lucky and i, I genuinely mean that we have, i think we have been very lucky and we got a, a few good wins on contracts and the people that we worked with on some of our early clients really really good people who have helped us grow through through word of mouth and yeah they're still our clients today and we're really grateful to those those people so yeah we have been lucky amazing and what does the future hold? Are you expanding? Have you got plans for the future? Or are you just happy the fact it's running as it is and going really well? Every day I'm happy that it's still going. I mean, every day I sort of live in constant fear that it's all going to collapse tomorrow. How do you manage? Is it just a bubbling away fear or it's right there? It's bubbling away. Sometimes it sort of spikes to being right there, you know, when, when something happens and we have to react. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Probably it's not good for my blood pressure or whatever, but I think it's pretty healthy to have a respect for what you've built and a, an urge to make sure it's, it's, it stays alive. I think that just turning that fear into energy is good. It kind of feels, you know, when you sort of start running again after you haven't been running for a while, and for the first sort of week or two, you're, you're looking at the ground just in front of your feet, trying to just get oxygen to your lungs. And then after a while, you start to sort of look around you and enjoy being outside and seeing things. It kind of feels like we're just getting to that stage with the business now where we can just raise our sort of line of sight a bit and start looking around for, okay, well, are we going to sort of diversify geographically? Are we going to diversify in terms of capabilities? Do we want to just keep growing the way we have done already? Or do we need to do some, some sort of step change in, in how we do our business developments or what type of projects we're looking at? I don't think we really know the answer yet. We're sort of feeling our way into it because, again, I think where we might be different to other sort of companies is that we haven't taken any big punt of that type you know we haven't brought on sort of business development managers and a team of bid writers who sit in wherever at a, at a huge cost we're still doing it all ourselves and so all of our growth has been you know pretty much debt free apart from in the early stages and for a couple of specific projects where we need to take on some short-term you know, debt just to just to buy assets and stuff so yeah short answer is i'm I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but hopefully just, if nothing else, keep keep going the way we have been so far. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Nick. That has been super helpful. And thank you again for all of your support because you were so encouraging of me when I was starting out. And I really, really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> not at all. I'm, I'm sure you're kicking ass. Well, we'll see. Slowly but surely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, great to chat, Jules. See you soon. 
Nick has been a dear friend of mine for over 25 years and watching him effectively grow up in the army and then face the prospect of leaving had us all guessing as to what he might do next. But it comes as no surprise to us Devon lot that he has built and scaled an incredible business so quickly. His advice to me about just getting a client straight away was brilliant as it gave me the confidence and breathing space to learn on the ground. If you'd like to contact Nick, you'll find all of his details in the show notes as well as a recap of all the advice he's kindly shared. I wanted to thank all the listeners that have kindly emailed me questions for future guests. I really do appreciate the feedback and also the input as we're all in this together. Do listen out for the questions in the next few weekly episodes and I would encourage anyone else to send some more in. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up, hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of PR consultancy for startups Fallowfield and Mason. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. I would be delighted if you'd rate, review and share this podcast with anyone else who might be starting a company in 2020.